Lee Sen Sen, age 65. He is a photojournalist who for 10 years, beginning in 1966, recorded the cultural revolution that swept through China. He photographed 100,000 pictures. It's been said that there is no other person with such an extensive archive. A Communist Party leader has his head forcibly shaved. Because his hairstyle was similar to that of Chairman Mao Zedong, the man was thought to have political aspirations. A Buddhist temple being destroyed. The destroyed image of Buddha was cruelly left exposed. Authorities ordered all photos which would damage the image of the Cultural Revolution to be confiscated. Li Sen Sen, risking great danger, continued to hide his photos. He believed that it was important to record each event as it happened and to keep a permanent record. He was born in 1940, in Dalian, and was raised in that farming village in Sendong province. At the age of 23, he became a photographer for a newspaper. Three years later, the Cultural Revolution began. Li Sen-Seng became the leader of a rebel group, which was to become the driving force behind the revolution. Chairman Mao himself ignited the flame that started the Cultural Revolution. This excited me tremendously. The struggle of revolution would make us strong, and we would cultivate a social view that would put an end to the bourgeois class. I thought this was a wonderful concept. But Li sen began to harbor doubts about the revolution. This was because attacks against those who spoke out against the revolution were much too severe. Moreover, Li Zhenzhen lost his position of leadership within the rebel group due to internal friction, and he was sentenced to hard labor in the countryside. Li Zhenzhen relocated to the United States in 1996. He brought an enormous number of negatives from China and, in 2003, published a photographic collection. In the early years, the Cultural Revolution was inspired by idealism, but the years following brought great pain. Just what did the Cultural Revolution mean? While organizing his photos, Li Sen-Sen groped for an answer. My strong desire now is to meet as many people as I can and to ask them what they think of the Cultural Revolution. If I seek out those people appearing in my photos, I think I may find some answers. It has been 40 years since the start of the Cultural Revolution. For the people captured in those photos, what kind of lives have they lived? How will they reflect upon the Cultural Revolution today? In April 2006, Mr. Li headed for China. With the photos as the basis for the trip to his homeland, we follow Li Setzen on his month-long journey. August 1966. This year, Chairman Mao, in pursuit of an ideal nation based upon socialism, put into motion the Cultural Revolution. In 
He declared that the old culture would be eliminated and those individuals pursuing capitalistic ways would be overthrown. Young people, one after another, formed rebel groups. They wore red armbands, chanted Mao's sayings, and called themselves the Red Guards. The Red Guards systematically destroyed symbols of the old culture, such as churches and temples. They began to denounce intellectuals and the power elite. Colleagues and even family members began indicting each other to avoid being targets of denouncement themselves. Mr. Lee was swept up in this sea of confusion. This is Herbin, the capital of Heilongjiang province. On the border of Russia, it has a population of 9.7 million people. At the time of the Cultural Revolution, this city was the scene of many violent clashes. Mr. Li photographed in Herbin and Beijing. Mr. Li first headed to the Buddhist temple in the center of town, Jili Temple. His first feelings of uneasiness with the Cultural Revolution began here and still remain firmly etched in his memory. In August 1966, Mr. Lee witnessed the Red Guard's uncontrolled, destructive behavior at Jili Temple, which shocked him. Forty years ago, when the Cultural Revolution began, things were terrible in this area. The plaza in front was filled with large crowds, and people were tightly packed, sitting in front of this gate. The Red Guards, posting a slogan of the destruction of the Jile Temple, overtook the temple and began its demolition. Their attack was something intense. They smashed the image of Buddha into pieces and took the sacred scriptures outside to burn. Mr. Lee photographed the monks who were ordered to stand in front of the gate. Among the many monks wearing robes, there was a monk in the Mao jacket holding a cap in his hand. Back then, I took one more photo. Here it is. This monk is smiling while looking at the elder monks. When I took this photo, I suddenly remembered something. Before the monks were brought to the temple gates, the Red Guards came surging into the temple and destroyed the images of Buddhas and such. It was this monk who guided those Red Guards to the locations. It was this monk who led the Red Guards to the temple that contained sacred scriptures and showed them where the images of Buddha were stored. The monks were driven out from the temple and forced to work in a factory manufacturing nails. The monks were finally able to return to Jili Temple after the Cultural Revolution ended. Mr. Lee heads towards a room in one section of the temple where the monk who had worn the Mao jacket is said to be living. Thank <laughs> you. 
。师傅，这个可以跟赤法大师说说话吗？ The spiritual master is 93 years old. He has been bedridden for seven years. By his side is principal priest Jing Po. The spiritual master has taught Buddhism to Jing Po for 20 years. Did the master ever talk about what happened back then? He talked a bit about it, but I don't know anything about what actually happened here. Mr. Li had heard that the spiritual master was still mentally alert and spoke to him personally. Spiritual master, at that time, the monks were attacked by many people and publicly humiliated. That caused my heart to grieve so much. My visit now, by imposing on your kindness, is to ask what your views are of those times. I know they were painful memories, but would you be willing to talk about them? Please take care of yourself. Thank you very much. The spiritual master did not speak one word of the incidents from that time. The spiritual master returned to the Jili temple after the Cultural Revolution ended and put his efforts into restoring the temple, which had been left in ruins. Afterwards, Jing Po invited Mr. Li to his room. Away from the spiritual master, Jing Po shed some light on the historical circumstances. You remember that the emphasis was on the poor. They became the flag wavers of the Cultural Revolution. The spiritual master didn't have a formal education, and he came from a poor rural area, so he was chosen by the rebel group. The master once said to me, the rebel group used me, and I was put into the position of having to manage and direct the other monks. Of course, others didn't look favorably upon this. When I arrived at this temple, there were some who said that the master was a terrible man. The master did not refute any of the charges. Today, the master continues to carry the burden of the past. Though the spiritual master only said, don't ask me anything, these words struck me as very painful. At that time, I was unable to stop the violence and could only record it with my camera. Beginning in 1963, Mr. Li worked for the Heilongjiang Daily, the Communist Party's newspaper, for 19 years. The company building hasn't changed. At one time, there were more than 300 people working here. Mr. Li unexpectedly runs into several retired employees who showed up at the company for a meeting. <laughs> How are you? Thanks to God, I'm 75 years old. I'm already 68 years old. At that time, you were a real workaholic. 
You shot more photos than anyone else and persisted in getting the newspaper to print them. Coming here, I remember the pain and the hardships of those times. Mr. Lee asked to see the room where he used to work. It's been 24 years since he quit the newspaper and last entered this room. Here's the faucet. This used to be the dark room where we developed the photos. I see the faucet has been turned off. My desk was over there. My desk would have been exactly in this area. Here, Mr. Lee and four other cameramen did photo processing, developing and drying photos. He said that extreme caution was used whenever photos showing violence towards the executive officers of the Communist Party were handled. Some photos could not be released because of the bad public image they would produce. I developed those photos after the co-workers went home and rushed them through the dryer. At the same time, a printable photo would always be at hand. That way, if someone came in, I would put the harmless photo on top of the other photo. I tried to look like I was doing my regular job while working overtime. That's how, during the midnight hours, I was able to develop photos, cut negatives, and hide them. In 1966, as the Cultural Revolution began, Mr. Lee formed a supportive rebel group within the newspaper company and became the group leader. The Cultural Revolution was not just an ordinary revolution, but an extremely large one. It was Chairman Mao himself who ignited the flame that started the Cultural Revolution. This excited me tremendously. The struggle of revolution would make us strong, and we would cultivate a social view that would put an end to the bourgeois class. I thought this was a wonderful concept. This is a photo of Mr. Lee in February 1967, when he was the leader of the rebel group. Mr. Lee was the MC at a meeting and denounced the members of other political factions as being unfit for Chairman Mao's revolution. The following year, he married a colleague within the rebel group and shortly after had two children. But while Mr. Lee continued taking photos, he gradually began to question the group's purpose and activities. A denunciation rally in August 1966. This is a photo of the Heilongjiang Provincial Party Committee Secretary being denounced. Mr. Lee could not understand why the Red Guards dashed black paint or made people wear dunce hats. This is the Heilongjiang Daily, which reported on the rally. Mr. Lee's photos of personal denouncement, which would damage the revolution's image, were never published in the newspaper. Mr. Lee also saw a scene that was hard to believe. Two factory technicians published a mimeograph newspaper called Facing North, 
which the party interpreted as facing Russia, enemy to the north. This brought charges against the two as a crime against the revolution, and they were executed. At the time of the execution, one of the men cried out, this world is too dark. With his hands tied, he cried out, this world is too dark. Then he closed his eyes, never to open them again. Whether one's eyes are open or closed, this is a dark world. I'm sure that's what he wanted to emphasize. The authorities would frequently demand that the newspaper hand over all photos that might damage the party's image. Mr. Lee made the decision to hide his negatives. He dug a hole under the floorboards of his house, wrapped the negatives in oil paper, and buried them. In December of 1968, Mr. Lee was denounced by a colleague who he thought he could trust. Mr. Lee was brought before the denunciation rally on the charge of plotting to overtake the newspaper. At that time, it was a situation where you had to attack your opponent or be attacked yourself. When I look back now on my experience as the leader of the rebel group, I can see that I was flying high. But now, I was being denounced, and I felt extreme pain. At that time, I realized how I also caused other people to suffer pain like this. During the day, Mr. Lee was denounced at the rally, and at night, his house was searched. A search for proof of the plot to take over the newspaper. While the authorities confiscated my letters and notes, I prayed they can take everything else, but please don't find those negatives. Luckily, the negatives weren't discovered. When they left, I was so overcome with relief that I collapsed into bed. The 100,000 negatives recording the Cultural Revolution were safe. But the following year, Mr. Lee was to face a severe punishment. Mr. Lee and his wife were sent to the Liuhe May 7th Cadet School under the premise that both lacked a sufficient understanding of the revolution. The Liuhe May 7th Cadet School was a collective farm established in 1968 by the party for re-education of party executives. In reality, this was a place for government officials, intellectuals, and others to be sentenced to hard labor. It was located in a region where the temperatures fell to minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. Mr. Lee worked as a lumberjack. He did not know when he would be released. He was held for two years. This is the Herbin Residence Sports Coliseum. Here, denunciation rallies and meetings were held daily. Mr. Lee often came here on assignment. In 
In September 1966, Mr. Lee photographed an influential person being overthrown. That person was the Heilongjiang provincial governor. I was shooting scenes of the people from below. Then an announcement was made that provincial governor Li Fan Wu had the same hairstyle as Chairman Mao. And that was proof of his political ambitions. Mr. Lee looked wide-eyed through the camera's viewfinder. The Red Guards began to cut provincial governor Li Fenwu's hair. This Red Guard used barber's clippers and adjusted them so they wouldn't cut smoothly. When hair got caught in the blades, he would suddenly yank the clippers out. You could see blood appearing where the hair was pulled out. That was just too cruel a thing to do. At the denunciation rally, provincial governor Li Fenwu's wife, Li Xia, had black paint spread across her face. Mr. Lee, hoping to get details of the incident from provincial governor Li Fenwu's daughter, visits her at home. Li 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 is 64 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Forty years ago, when the Cultural Revolution began, she was a student at the Herbing Engineering University and a member of the Red Guard. Lili begins to talk about her father's denouncement. This photo was taken in August 1966 in Tiananmen Square when one million people gathered for the Cultural Revolution Celebratory Congress and Li 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 shook hands with Chairman Mao. Li Li, who happened to be in Beijing, was appointed by the government authorities to be the student representative giving a speech. We will accomplish the goal of the Cultural Revolution to the end. Long live Chairman Mao. Long live the Chinese Communist Party. When I finished reading the speech and turned around, Chairman Mao was standing there. I heard later that while I was reading the speech, Chairman Mao was looking at the paper over my shoulder. Lili made the declaration, we will accomplish the goal of the Cultural Revolution to its completion. But this speech gave rise to hurtful rumors about her father. Rumors spread that provincial governor Li Fenwu's political ambition drove his daughter into Tiananmen Square. Because her father's hairstyle was similar to Chairman Mao's, and because of the speech Li Li gave, political criticism toward her parents increased. Lili has carefully stored the clothes her parents had worn during the denunciation rally. These are father's pants. His name, Li Fenwu, is written on them. 
These are mother's pants. Oh, sure. New coat. At that time, mother, who had a stooped back, was told to stand up straight and was stabbed in the buttocks repeatedly with a drill bit. When the rebel group came to arrest mother, I was at home when they knocked on the front door. Mother pushed me into the closet. At that time, mother told me, remember to always trust your father and mother. We are loyal Communist Party members. We haven't done anything wrong. Since then, I've firmly believed that father and mother have never deceived me. While sharing her story, she explains that her older sister was the one who indicted her father. Shortly after the Cultural Revolution began, the rebel group went to the middle school where my older sister was a teacher. They threatened her. Your younger sister needs an attitude readjustment, so we plan to denounce her. At any rate, you'll end up just like her. We're going to try all of you, father and children. My sister became frightened. She told them she could not write an indictment. Then the rebel group told her they would write one, so they made up a false indictment, claiming my father had illicit affairs and made my sister copy it. In 1966, following in the footsteps of her father and mother, Li 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 was also imprisoned by the Red Guards. It took seven years before Li Li was able to see her parents freely. Before the Cultural Revolution, we were one happy family. As sisters, we got along well. Wherever we went, we went together as a family. And we had a terrific home life. Why did my sister do something like that to betray my father? As a result of that incident, I've limited any contact with my sister. Even now, they are estranged. Mr. Lee also wanted to hear the older sister's story regarding the circumstances, but in the end, he was unable to speak with her. After hearing Li Li's story, Mr. Li remembered another photo he took. In October 1966, Mr. Li accompanied a unit of the Red Guards from Heilongjiang province to Beijing. At that time, he photographed Chairman Mao meeting with the people. This is a photo of the Red Guards after the chairman's car had driven past them. This girl has written down that this was an extreme moment of happiness. Mr. Lee decides to visit this Red Guard. Shu oh. hey. Yun is 61 years old. At the time of the photo, she was a student at the Herbin Foreign Language Technical College. In 1967, she had joined an influential revolutionary committee as a Red Guard member. 
this committee had overthrown the previous government. She brings out a picture. It is a photo of a group from the Heilongjiang Revolutionary Committee visiting Beijing in April 1967. This is the former Prime Minister, Tso Enlai. Also in the photo with Xu is Zhang Qing, a leader of the Cultural Revolution who was later sentenced to death. The Revolutionary Committee was expanding into the Northeast region and calling it the New Dawn. I thought it was a really great honor to be able to work there, and I was bragging to everyone. Mr. Li shows Xu the photo of provincial governor Li Fenwu getting his head shaved. This is just terrible. I can't stand to look at this. I've never been in such an awful situation. The provincial governor was overthrown, and you participated in the newly formed Revolutionary Committee. So, as a former committee member, what are your thoughts? Looking at these photos and recalling the movement to overthrow the capitalist leaders, I suppose extreme measures had to be taken sometimes. But personally speaking, I learned much from my superiors in the committee. And I worked diligently. The committee was where I started out. And I don't regret that I worked there. I am satisfied with the path that I have chosen. Ms. Shi continued to work for a government agency after the Cultural Revolution rising to the position of department head. Tired last year. After the Cultural Revolution, fate played a big part in scattering the Red Guards. Mr. Li tried to find those Red Guards who shaved Provincial Governor Li Fenwu's hair and to get their reactions as to what happened at that time. It seems, from their uniforms they were wearing, at the time the Red Guards were Hubing Engineering University students. Mr. Lee visits Herbing Engineering University, previously known as Herbing Military Engineering University, to look for clues. Mr. Lee goes to the retirees' break room and encounters several graduates. You're asking about the Cultural Revolution. Aren't these members of the 65 faction? Do you know these people? Not only do I know them, but the 6-5 faction was the most aggressive rebel faction at the time. Their major was missile engineering. It's where Mao Zedong's nephew, Mao Yan Sin, was. Right, Mao Yan Sin was there. That department doesn't accept commoners. Everyone there is the child of a high-level government official. You know they had supporters backing them. The common folks wouldn't have the courage to stand up to the provincial governor. Mm. 
These students enrolled in 1965 and formed the 6-5 faction of the Red Guards. With such high-level officials as parents, it was said that these students couldn't help but take the radical path. They were caught in a very complicated situation. They were different from us common folks. Many of their fathers could be overthrown at a moment's notice. Then to show off how much revolutionary spirit they had, they went and did something like this. Can I meet them? They probably wouldn't want to meet you. So you think it would be difficult? Besides, they're probably no longer living in Arbin. Mr. Lee also met with other school officials, but did not learn the whereabouts of those Red Guards involved in the hair-cutting incident. In 1968, Mr. Lee was photographing the heroes of the People's Liberation Army. One soldier gave a speech at the meeting called Putting Chairman Mao's Teaching into Practice. He was praising Chairman Mao. Then, those in the audience who were moved by the speech came up to the stage and pinned their Mao Zedong badges on him. The number of badges soon totaled 170. The rebel hero who carried forward the revolution and who had fervently studied the works of Chairman Mao. What kind of life is he currently living? Mr. Lee visited a farming village outside the suburb of Chichihe, the second largest city in Heilongjiang province, located 170 miles northwest of Herbin. Hey, Wang Go Chang is 63 years old. Mr. Wang's family were poor tenant farmers, but after the People's Republic of China was founded, the communists enacted land reforms so that the family was able to own their own land. <laughs> Mr. Wang felt a debt of gratitude to the communists and enlisted in the People's Liberation Army at the age of 20. Mr. Wang has kept his Chairman Mao badges preciously stored away. The box has Mao sayings inscribed on it. There was a song based on this saying, if I remember. Mr. Wong has close to 140 badges total. Jamie. Oh. Jamie. This is the badge on the hat. Mr. Wong says that despite the many tragedies that arose from the Cultural Revolution, the entire movement should not be repudiated. 700 million people took part in this huge movement. So from an historical view, this event must not be forgotten. We are survivors from that era. It would be strange if every single person living during that time were to deny that those events happened. Mr. Wong worked for a government agency after his military discharge and retired three years ago due to mandatory retirement.
Life has not been easy for Mr. Wong since retiring. Due to China's recent reform of state-owned enterprises, Mr. Wong's wife and two children, who worked for state-owned companies, have all been laid off. In order to support their children, Mr. and Mrs. Wong sold their apartment in the city and are now raising pigs in this farming village. The communist doctrine says that private property is to be totally eliminated and personal profit and self-interest are also goals to be abolished. Up to now, I've based my life on this viewpoint, and my actions have reflected this thinking. But recently, having toiled for several decades, I feel that maybe overnight we've gone back to where we were before the Communist Party took power. This is because when I look at society now, I see how much personal profit and self-interest are out in the forefront and have become so obvious. China has undergone a major transformation since the Cultural Revolution. There has been a push for liberalizing reforms. Against this background, this former hero continues to seek the truth. Mr. Lee has spent one month visiting those people he photographed. Mr. Lee now travels to Tiananmen Square as his last stop before returning home to the United States. October 1966. Here, Mr. Lee photographed the Red Guards chanting Mao's sayings and fervently shouting, Long live Chairman Mao. Back then, Mr. Lee personally had high expectations for the dawning of a new era here at Tiananmen Square. But after seeing Tiananmen Square now, Mr. Lee says he only feels a sense of futility. At the time, I believed in Chairman Mao and his ideas and supported the Cultural Revolution wholeheartedly. I was excited while photographing the events around Tiananmen Square. It's been 40 years since then. Trying to find the answer to my question of what the Cultural Revolution meant, I met with the various people captured in my photos. Still, I don't think I've been honest in my feelings about the revolution. I realize now that I still can't come to terms with the harsh reality of the Cultural Revolution. I continue to feel anxiety and grief. In 1981, the Chinese Communist Party denounced the Cultural Revolution by issuing this statement. The leaders were wrong in causing the revolution and the subsequent disastrous civil war it brought to the people. It has been about 40 years since the Cultural Revolution began, but there are hardly any media events planned in China that reflect back on the events of that time. Mr. Li Zhenzhen recorded the Cultural Revolution with his 100,000 photos. For him, the Cultural Revolution is not simply a history lesson. Even now, he continues to be confused by these world-shaking events. <laughs> 